thanks everyone for coming first. Uh, appreciate it. Um, this is not going to be your typical IT presentation. First up, I'm going to leave our DJ booth slash pirate ship thing that we have here um, and uh, creaking away because uh, I tend to pace about a lot. Um, and secondly, there are going to be no code samples. Uh, we're not going to talk about technology in depth. Um, this is really a session about the opportunity that you all have to enable the business to do what they need to do using enterprise social. And before I start, I just want to get a sense in the room of where people's backgrounds are. How many of you attended Christoph's presentation yesterday on enterprise social? OK, great. How many of you use or are thinking of using enterprise social inside your organizations? Grand. OK, brilliant. And how many of you would like the people within the line of business to say that you helped them get their work done faster? And how many of you think that the business says that about you right now? Wow, OK, great. So <laughs> you've come to the right place, which is fantastic. Um, let me just explain who I am and who my uh, colleague uh, here in the DJ booth is. Um, my name is Mike. I run something called the Customer Success Organization for Yammer. And all I do and my team, we go and talk to customers about how to get the most out of enterprise social networking. And when we say get the most out of it, we don't mean installing it. We don't mean configuring it. We mean getting real business value out of it. So helping organizations change the way that they work using enterprise social networking. So we talk to HR directors, we talk to marketing people, we talk to CIOs, we talk to you fine people about how you can use this to really change the way you do business. This is really the opportunity that enterprise social networking presents. And the purpose of the presentation today is to share with you some secrets, some things you might want to avoid, some pitfalls, some examples, and some things that you can do next. Hi, so I'm Miguel Garcia, uh, originally from Texas, but as someone from the audience kindly reminded me, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> That's because I've been in London for a few years. Uh, but I'm also a customer success manager in Mike's team. Uh, I've worked with a whole range of customers from some of the big consultancies around the world to small startups in London. So it's a wide range of industries as well, oil and gas, um, automotive industry as well. So we basically what I do is help businesses understand the people and culture aspect and the change management aspect of combining some of these social tools with the work that people do every day. So we sit down and we do a few workshops and we explain to people uh, the method, the, the way that you develop these things. Um, and then we also do some of the technology part, although that is small. And, and we'll cover that today in the presentation as well. We're very happy to be here. Great. And if you want to reach us outside of this, you can get hold of us on Twitter. Our, our handles are up there. We, we tend to check it uh, pretty, pretty regularly. So this is all about enabling the business to work differently. So if you think about the opportunity that enterprise social networking presents for organizations, it's the idea that uh, by communicating openly and by networking people together effectively, you can get work done faster. So networks are an effective way of getting a lot of things done. When you think about the context of the business world and how the business world is changing, you have process optimized a lot of the core things that the organization does. So you, you have ERP, you have Lean, and all of these things for optimizing how you do the core of what your business does. And so what's left is the ability to adapt to changing circumstances inside businesses, so agility to react to new opportunities in the market, to react to um, you know, changes in what your competition is doing, or somebody that's trying to displace you from the market entirely, or the management of exceptions, so things that your processes don't cover, questions that you don't have answers written down to somewhere that people can just deal with straight away. And so enterprise social networking and the concept behind it is all about how you get the right people together to help in those situations. So when, when the, the playbook that you've got doesn't cover how you should be operating as a business. 
And to do that, you need to be able to connect the right people together very quickly, let them have a conversation about how you might adapt to this thing that has changed, and take action on the back of it. And that's the thing that enterprise social networking really lets you do. And that's the opportunity to enable the business. So you have a gr you're, you're in a great position to be the people that explain to the business how this can change how they do their work, get them to buy into it and adapt to it, and get them to realize and then measure the value that comes out of it. And it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity because it is a very straightforward thing to do from a technical point of view. It is also an incredibly easy thing that is IT that you can stand in the way of if you don't watch out for some particular pitfalls. So we'll go into those in a bit more detail in a moment. So alongside with enabling the business uh, and asking the right questions, um, these are obviously some of the questions that we see a lot when we go and we talk to IT is, you know, we want something that deploys quickly, we want those seamless upgrades, we want something that's safe and reliable. And those are obviously questions that you, you have carried on from previous conversations that you've had when you've implemented these things. So a lot of the things we do is we hope you answer those questions so that we can make sure and identify the things that, you know, where your business is currently headed at. But we also try to instill in you a new direction as well, a new way of thinking. And today, uh, there's a lot, you know, a lot of the stuff we're covering in this presentation is about that, is about, you know, you're coming in with questions because of the way you've used previous social tools and, and other collaboration tools, but now it's, it's really a, a new change and we try to explain to you and, and, and try to work with you in finding the ways that you can explain this to the business and pitch yourself in a different manner so that you are actually empowering your individuals and so the business is actually uh, able to listen to you more easily and understand uh, how you're going to implement these tools. So, some secrets. Well, they're not secret anymore. Um, I wish every IT organization understood that this was the, the differentiator that something like Yammer gives to you uh, to be able to be able to enable the business effectively. So Miguel talked about time to value, uh, the ability to you know, deploy things very quickly for people to get very quick access, for people to be able to um, not have to worry about upgrades and all, all these kind of things. And if you had to summarize the, the kind of the four key things that something like Yammer would give to an organization from an IT perspective, time to value becomes right at the top. So for those that don't know, Yammer is a freemium service. Individuals can sign up to it. They can invite their colleagues. They can all start working in a network together. And they can do that today in seconds. Chances are that those that said they weren't using Yammer, there are people in your organization that are already making use of this, already connecting with their colleagues. I would strongly encourage you all after this session to go and sign up and take a look to see what's happening there, what people are doing, and where they're already maybe getting value from it. So there's a great time to value story there, which is that you as, as IT can say, hey, look, there's this, there's this thing here. We think it is useful. We've got a few people on it already. If we put our arms around this and helped everyone else understand where the value might be, this is something that is incredibly valuable for the organization. And it isn't something that is the wrong side of a 12-month project. It is something that we can start doing today and build on iteratively. Integrations as well. So you know, we recognize that this has to be a platform that IT are both able to support that fits with all of the you know all, all the requirements that IT organizations have so the ability to do things like wiring in the user management to Active Directory so you don't have to worry about that the ability to put a usage policy on there so that everybody understands what they should and should not be doing wire it up to single sign on make it visible through SharePoint all of those things are available and they're all pretty straightforward to set up as well. So again, a great opportunity to be the hero and help people you know, really make use of this and help legitimize it as a tool within the business. The third one is you know, voluntary adoption or virality. So the idea that because people can invite other people when they feel they need that person in the network to collaborate, that's a very, very powerful driver of enterprise social networking. Um, and one of the things that I would say to you is, Embrace that idea if you're planning for enterprise social network adoption. The number of IT organizations that come to me and say, I've got loads of people signing up for this thing and I don't know what I should do about it. And you say, isn't that what you actually want to happen? 
in collaboration tooling. You want people to use this. That's the whole point of using these, these tools, is that people use them to derive value. So embrace the idea that this is something that will grow very quickly and think less about controlling the deployment in stages and think more about adapting to how these people are, are coming on and understanding where the value might be. You'll be a lot happier. The users will be a, a lot happier. And you'll be more likely to generate value in the long term. And the fourth point is around the customer network and the fact that you are not alone in going on this, going on this journey. We have thousands of customers who are going on this journey with you as well, and we proactively network them all together. So there is a single Yammer network for all paying customers of Yammer in the world, and they can all come on there. They can all tell us what they think about you know, how things are going. But more importantly, they can meet with everyone else who is going on the journey at the same time, share their experiences, share their stories, learn from each other, and really work in the way that we, we espouse organizations should be working together. So that's a great, you know, another great thing to, to bear in mind, that you want to be identifying the people in your organization who would benefit from being part of that community, yourselves being one of them, and get them into that, that network, because then they'll learn from their peers and, and, and continue, to, continue to build. So some things to know and some pitfalls to avoid. Try not to get yourselves into a position where you are perceived as the barrier between people trying to exchange knowledge and collaborate. Try and be, like, position yourselves as an enabler to that, as the people that understand how this works, how it fits with everything else, what people can and where people can get value from it. And try and very much position yourselves as an enabler rather than a blocker. Um, because you know, people, can, people can use these tools, they can use other tools, um, so you want, to be, you want to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Think very carefully about the fact that the majority of use of, of, of these sort of tools comes from people not necessarily at their desk, at their computer. They might be on their mobile phone. They might be out in the field somewhere using a, using a tablet. Um, and so don't necessarily think about this as something that you have to trap behind the firewall because you might lose a lot of the benefit. We work with a, a lot of retailers and people that have a huge number of field-based employees, some of whom don't even have email addresses. And they say that one of the main benefits is that these people can access this at home. They can access it on their mobile devices when they're on the go. They can access it when they're in the shops. Um, and so think very carefully about, about that and the, the advantages that cloud provides to this, both in terms of speed of innovation and iteration. Yammer releases twice weekly, um, and we, we're continually innovating and iterating the product, um, and the access that that actually gives to the people that are in the field and the people that are trying to get work done. And then if you're after a simple definition of what Yammer does, it helps you unlock the collective intelligence of the organization. So it gives you the theoretical possibility to ask everyone in your organization to help you solve a problem. In reality, you're not asking everyone. You're asking everyone that has joined the group that you're posting the message to. So you're asking all of the people that care about the topic you're posting a question about to help you solve that, help you find the answer to that question. So it's really the idea of drawing on the networks that already exist within your business to get work done faster. Another key question that always comes up is, you know, what happens if someone goes rogue on the network? What happens if somebody posts something obscene or offensive? Um, and two things there. Firstly, you're perfectly right to worry about that, but it happens very, very little in practice. And secondly, as we say up here, people don't go to work to get fired. They don't post stupid things, by and large, because they're on a stage that is composed of everybody in their organization. So they're unlikely to, um, to, to post anything uh, offensive. And secondly, that because this is a community of people, you find that the community steps in before you have to as IT. They'll say, hold on, that's not fair, or here's a counterpoint to it, because you've now got a group of people. It's like if anybody up here suddenly stood up and shouted something, chances are I wouldn't have to step in. Somebody else would say, hey, you know, hang on a minute. And the community works in a very, very similar way. So trust the community because they can help you get an enormous, um, they can help you scale. They'll help you do these, these sort of things at scale. Executive sponsorship, leadership by example, 
Um, people follow examples. People like to see the executives and the leadership legitimizing that this is something that people should use within the organization. So get executive sponsorship. Get leaders to model the behaviors you want to see others doing within the network. And don't just get one. You know, get several. Use the one executive that you get to bring the others on the journey with you. Don't try to over-organize this. So social networks tend to be built in a way that allows, them to, allows the people that are on the networks to help self-organize it. So if they set up a group and it turns, up that, turns out that the group isn't useful, the group won't get used, and therefore the group will start disappearing down in the search results and people will forget it's there. Um, if somebody sets up a group and there's already a group that's got the same purpose, then the community will step in and say, hang on, you know, should we perhaps combine these two? So focus your role less on saying, you must come through me before you can set a group up, and more on, hey, you did realize that there's already something similar set up over here. So the, the, the principle of community management and helping the people that are on that network own the, the development and the drive of it without feeling like there's some sort of central force controlling it is really, it's a really, really important factor in adoption. And finally, uh, and I always say this, it's not magic. If you just put the technology out there, do not expect that everyone will just use it. Uh, you need to provide them with an understanding of what it might be used for. You need to provide them with examples. You need to provide them with you know, people that are demonstrating example behaviors, success stories. All of these things are really important to get people to understand how they might want to change the way that they communicate to take advantage of the thing that you're providing them. If all you do is say, hey, we're going to do enterprise social networking tomorrow and release, then um, you'll see a few people get it, but a lot of people won't. You need to take them on that journey. And so on that last point about you know, this not being magic and you having to put a plan through, I have a lot of customers that are always asking me, you know, uh, you know when is the right time to, to talk to the business? When, when should we bring them in? And my answer is always, you, know, you should have them there from day one, really. Uh, you should dip, definitely make them part of that building process. The times when I see IT put in so much effort into Yammer and you know, making sure that everything is integrated correctly, you've hit all your technical points, and all of a sudden they've discovered that in those few months where they spent planning the, you know, the technical aspects of Yammer, you actually already have your users using it. You already actually have groups uh, under your departments, projects, so they realize that a lot of this planning should have been done with the business, should have been concentrated on with the people. Um, so the next part, I'm going to explain some of the, the why that's happening and how the world is changing. So one of my favorite topics uh, is social media. And it's also the way that people are using social media for all kinds of things today. Uh, you know, the, the, as consumers, we are shopping differently. We're looking for work differently. We're traveling differently. And the, the question there is, why are we not working differently as well? Why are we still facing the same barriers? So if you think about it, um, and I've seen this over and over as well, is, you know, you've got... You use devices, you use different products, uh, you know, like Facebook. I mean, how many of you are at least on one of these, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn? That should be most of you in the room. So, you know, this is the reality of the space, is that people are using these tools, but then they get to work, and all of a sudden the environment changes. The rules change, the devices change. It's obviously understandable why some of that, those rules would change. Uh, you know, you've got things like security, but most of them, you really have to ask yourself is, why are we not allowing people to work more in the ways that they're comfortable in working? Because that's when they'll do the best work for the company. That's when they will make the, the best contributions. And we see that over and over, is that when companies finally open up and allow people to work in those ways, uh, you know, the effect is, is pretty big. Um, so some of the things we've seen is, you know, the rise of the social consumer and how people, you know, are using social media to, to complain. And it's really obvious when a company is paying attention and when a company is not paying attention. And, it, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of, you know, funny things that have happened out there because of that. Uh, and, and the other thing is, you know, because of these changes that are happening outside of your companies, you know, there's now, you know, always consumers on an average of four devices every day. You've got, you know, 84% of people, you know, working remotely. So it's, it's really deciding how as a business 
uh, you can implement more flexibility in the ways that people work. And, and as Yammer, as customer success managers, we help you identify that and we help you as well to provide the best answer for, for people. And w one of the biggest things we always say is, what's in it for me is when we're sitting down with you, when we're sitting down with the business, is just identifying as individuals, you know, what's in it for you in, in implementing these tools? Why are you interested and what do you want to get out of them? So all of this leads to, obviously you've heard a lot of this, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but the consumerization of IT. Um, and I actually think that you're in a very special position right now because even though, you know, this slide is showing you IT budgets, you know, down 5%, I actually think you're in a really special position because you can do so much more with less. You can make, so, you, you can make a positive impact in the business um, with a lot less. And, and, you know, at Yammer, we, we work with you as well to, to identify how you do that. And a lot of it, as we discussed, is, is partnering with the business. Um, and when you partner with the business, you're seen differently, you're empowering, um, and, and your role is changing, and, and you're able to adapt more quickly because, you know, a lot of people uh, are, are afraid of, well, what does this mean for me, you know, if, if I'm no longer needed for these things? It's, no, no, you've got a new role. You've got new things that you can take care of. And actually, these new things are able to make more of an impact in that business. So I think the, the, the key point I take away from the, the change in the dynamics of, of spending is that the line of business need to understand how to deliver the maximum business impact from the money that they're investing in technology. And so as IT, the idea that you can find effective partners within, within the line of business and say, look, you know, if you're, if you're going to put some spend towards something like enterprise social networking, then let me as the expert in that help you understand where that benefit might be. Work with you to make sure that this is going to align with IT standards and, and approaches and fit with the, the infrastructure that we've got. And then work with you to make sure that that value actually comes to reality. Because then I as IT am adding value to you in helping you realize the, the benefit from the money that you're spending. And, our, and we work together to make sure that our organization works faster and better. So the idea of finding, finding a passionate partner. So you know, look out for people that have a passion for this sort of thing within your organization. So they're not just within IT. Typical homes for passionate partners for, for enterprise social networking are places like the communications function. So internal communicators are continually talking about how do I understand whether people are actually engaging with the messages that I'm sending out in these all company emails and voicemails because nobody ever replies to them. So I actually have no idea what my organization thinks or feels about these messages that I'm giving out. Um, people in, like salespeople in the field want to understand, you know, if I'm walking into a new customer, I need to understand who in my organization knows those people that I'm going to talk to. And I need to understand wh what the latest is about the product that I'm trying to sell to them. Because those bits of information will get me closer to closing a deal. So I, those are the things that I really care about. And connecting into a network of people that is my entire organization can really help me with that. Because you know, particularly around the who knows this person type question. It could be that somebody in a completely disconnected part of the organization plays golf with them regularly. You don't, you don't know until you ask the question. So look around inside the line of business for people that would be very passionate about making this sort of change in the way that the organization communicates. And they're pretty easy to spot because they're people that say, I can't find the right information. I don't know who knows this. We keep having this problem where we miss this because we didn't realize this department was doing it. And present yourselves in this style of communication as a way of solving that problem. And you're immediately incredibly valuable to the organization. Another great source of finding passionate partners is, as I said, go and join your network already if you're not already on it. Because the people that are likely to want to make use of this are probably already on there. And they're probably already thinking about how can I, you know, how can we use this as an organization? And you can partner with them and say, hey, you know, let's let's try and do this together and see how see how this is going to work. I wanted to just give you a few examples because I'm aware that 
enterprise social can seem very nebulous um, and, and kind of this idea of free open communication for everyone and it will be amazing and the, our whole organization will morph into this Borg-like entity overnight. But it's not, it has real practical applications. So here's three of them. So in a professional services organization, staffing people and getting the right people on the right work is critical. You know, because if you do that, your customer's happier, you tend to be able to do the work faster, which means more profit, um, and the people that you, are, you have within your organization tend to be happier because they're doing the things that they're passionate about. So instead of having a centralized clearinghouse for, for staffing people on things, what some professional services organizations are doing instead is saying, hey, you know, let's, uh, create, a, let's create groups for staffing requests. Anybody that is interested in, in new things that are coming up will watch that group. If you have an opportunity coming up on a project, post it in there. And they find that the community then self-organizes and says things that you would never have notice in a formalized staffing system, like, hey, this person is, isn't showing up on the staffing tool, but I know they'd be interested in a move, and I know their manager would be, would be interested as well. So you start to be able to draw on all that intelligence from the people in the organization to make your processes run more effectively. Or in shops, so store managers just sharing how they're laying out their shelves with each other, which then you know, they, they learn from the experiences that their peer store managers are sharing. They then start laying their stores out in the same way. The stores become more profitable. The functionality for both of those things, the ability to set a group up and get people to post messages in it and or photographs. So it's very simple functionality, but the, the thing that drives the, the benefit is the behavior. And so within the IT organization, helping people understand that it's really all about that and helping them understand how to get that, get that value, that's how you get effective partnership happening. And you've got to go beyond IT when it comes to, when it comes to getting buy-in. I know that probably should be pretty obvious from what we've been saying so far. Um, but the number of, uh, you know, there, is, there is benefit in this for IT as well. So in terms of things like you know, allowing users to start solving some of their own IT problems. A great example is the you know, help on Excel, because your real Excel experts aren't necessarily in your IT service desk. They're probably in the finance department. And they'd love to help if somebody actually asks them a question every once in a while. And so the idea of allowing people to form self-help things that IT oversee and correct if people are, you know, because sometimes people come up with the wrong information. But you find that there's much greater satisfaction because people are solving each other's problems. And, uh, and you can tap into a lot of deep expertise within the organization. Or simple things like if you're running a project and you want to understand what your users think about it and you want to be able to help troubleshoot things, set up a group. People can see that other people are raising questions. People can help, help each other answer those questions. And more importantly, people can see when those questions have already been asked, so you don't get asked the same question 50 times, because it's happening openly and happening visibly. But don't just focus within IT. So a big pitfall that we, we see people falling into around this is IT says, enterprise social networking sounds like something we should do. Let's us, as the IT organization, pile onto the network and see what we, see what we can do. And then somebody from HR joins it, and they say, oh, it's just a bunch of IT guys talking about IT stuff. I'm not, I'm not interested. So think very carefully about the, what you would want this network to look like in the long term, and set your own behaviors up on it in a way that's compatible with that. So simple things like, if you're going to talk about IT stuff and IT projects, put them in specific groups for the purpose, so that if somebody joins and isn't necessarily interested in it, they can tune out and set their own things up. So bear in mind where you're trying to get to. IT very important in the process, great benefits for IT specifically, but make sure that you're, you're building it in terms of where the long-term destination is. So we've been talking a lot about this, you know, focusing on the people, focusing on the culture, uh, not so much on the technology. And I'll just give you an example, a, a good example and a bad example of how this was driven. So I worked with a, with a large business school, and one of the things that IT was trying to work out is, okay, we've got orientation week. We've got all these students coming in. What are the common issues, the problems that arise when, when they first show up for that week? Um, and, you know, the, while they were thinking about 
how IT should be using it, we combined it with the student journey. So we said, okay, who are your customers? Who are you having to serve? Um, and when we flipped that, when we started looking at the student journey, all of a sudden IT found a way to say, well, okay, we know that students are downloading a lot of things that first week. They're making sure that they've got the antivirus software. Um, they've got their things for their courses. They've got printer drivers, things like that. Um, and then we realized, okay, well, actually, we can put all of this stuff in a Yammer group where students in that first week can just go to the group. Um, you've got all the instructions in there. You can easily download things from the group. And then IT is able to easily gauge as well, are, you know, are people using this? Are they finding it helpful? What are the issues that are quickly coming up? And you know, that is the group that, that first, first few weeks was actually the largest group with the most activity in it because it was so easy for students to access everything they needed. And IT was empowering them, empowering the business as well. So that was what that combination of focusing on the technology but also the, the people and the culture helped us do. Um, in a bad example, it's where IT doesn't bring the business at all and they implement a lot of groups, they implement a lot of ways that they think the business might use it, and this was with an oil and gas company. And, you know, we spent about six, seven months coming up with that. And in those six, seven months, the growth of Yammer exploded. And uh, by the time, we, you know, IT wanted to revisit the plan, we realized that the business had already decided how to use Yammer. So obviously they lost a bit of position in there because they didn't bring the business first. So it was very difficult for them to catch up and say, okay, well, we've got to change the rules around a bit. We've got to play by these new set of rules. So that's, that's the importance of concentrating in, in, on the culture and, and the people. And as customer success managers, that is our major uh, job is to help you with those things and help you realize that and make sure that we're identifying, getting the right stakeholders in place so that we can have those conversations early on and we don't fall in those pitfalls, you know, and make sure that we identify the right reasons for, for the business to use it and not just IT. And obviously, and Mike covered this as well, you know, people are always asking, well, what happens if somebody, you know, posts some obscene materials, um, you know, arguments, things like that. And, you know, we, we rarely see any of that. And one of the things I always say is, you've got a big network, there's a big picture with your big face on it, you know, so it's very hard to hide behind anything. And then you have a network of people that are self-policing, so people will come up and make sure that, you know, there's a, the community management aspect of it as well. Um, and the other example I always give is that I work with a lot of schools as well. And these schools have anywhere from 11-year-olds to, you know, 16-year-olds, and nothing major has ever happened. So I'm, if you can have a network full of children, and not have any issues. I'm sure adults can, should be able to handle it. So that's one of the examples I use for that. Um, the other points that we get as well is user, users are always telling us, you know, we already have so many tools. You know, we already use too many things. Yammer is just going to be another one, uh, you know, component of that. And that's when the business is not looking at Yammer in the right way. The, the thing is, we have a lot of ways to add Yammer is an integration, but it also should be a social layer. So I always tell people, if it's not facilitating your day-to-day -day work, you're not using it in the right way. Um, it, should be, it should be helping you consolidate everything. And one of the first conversations we also have is, how can we find a way for you to consolidate all those tools that you already use so that we can facilitate the work that you're trying to do as IT, the work that you're trying to do as a business? So that's one of the first things we get out of the way as well, because we realize, you know, users won't get on there. You know, if they, just, if they feel they are already using a tool that's doing the job for them, they're not going to get on there. You have to show them how they can, you know, use less tools, consolidate some of that, and then also add it on to Yammer and help them through, you know, help them understand that aspect of it. So we have things here like, you know, mail, SharePoint, link, things like that. So it's all about that. And one of the things we do is, you know, we find, we take a scenario, so this one is needing to find expertise, and we say, okay, well, what are the ways that you're sometimes doing that? Instant messaging, email, not very effective, right? You need to know some of the people already, or you have to email and ask the question someone and then get connected that way. And then we say, well, let's take the scenario and show how it would work on Yammer. On Yammer, if I wanted to find expertise, I could post a comment in a group where there's hundreds of other people that I don't even know, but because they've seen my comment, they're able to then connect me with the right people. And it all happens in one thread. And everybody can also take, so anybody else that is working on this sim similar project or you know, might have a similar question can hop on there as well. And this happens a lot. We have a, what we call Yam Jams within Microsoft. And you know, we have our country managers on there and they post one question and that leads to, we had over 500 conversations within that hour from people across the business. And what's interesting is that it's not just useful to see what the 
top executives are saying or the questions they're posing, but I'm actually able to connect because of that one thread and all those conversations to people in the business who are doing very similar things to what I'm doing that add value where we can collaborate. So that is something that, you know, once you look at that, it's really interesting how that works out. So those are some of the scenarios that we use to explain people, okay, how could it actually facilitate, how could it actually consolidate the things that you do and make sure that you're using the tools that are most effective for the work that you're trying to get done. So before I talk about uh, data retention, um, I used to be a, a document management consultant, by the way, so I, I do understand a bit of this stuff. Um, just coming back to this about, about which tool when, it's again, it's one of these things that comes up a lot during the, during the design phase and then doesn't necessarily come up again as long as you've set up the right criteria to help people find their own way and help people understand what the benefits of each of the different types of tools are and some suggestions of what they might be used for. But you've really got to let people use what they feel is useful in order to get their work done. Because at the end of the day, the, process, the, the purpose of this is to, is to set up an environment where people can get their work done faster. That's really what you're aiming to do. So mandating that people use something that they don't necessarily feel is optimal for the thing that they're trying to achieve is not going to help when you're thinking about the end value that you're trying to get to. What is going to help is to provide a bit of guidance to people that says, hey, you know, these things are good at, this is good at X, and this is really good at Y, and so bear that in mind when you're deciding where to work. Data retention is something that we, we hadn't covered when I talked a bit about all of the you know, things that you would do to make sure that this is a supported and, and compliant platform within an IT organization. But rest assured, we do have uh, you know, approaches for doing that. We have an API for exporting all of the, all of the data so that you can then put it into whatever you know, compliance management system that you have. And so you can take your enterprise social network and, and manage it for compliance in the same way that you would manage a lot, of your, you know, a lot of your other content management systems. So that was just a very quick point for those that might have that as a question to say, yes, it is possible to do this. We do this with a lot of major organizations from you know, defense to pharmaceuticals. So there's a lot of different approaches for doing it, um, and it's entirely possible. Um, coming back to the, the change point. So, a few, few really, really simple tips that we'd like to you know, make sure that you go away with. Having a clear vision for what enterprise social networking might actually do for the organization that makes sense at the level of the individual will help hugely in getting people to adopt. So it has to be more specific than we want to collaborate better or we want to work more openly. It has to have things like as somebody that works in a store, I w I, the benefit that enterprise social networking has for you is the ability to connect with other people who are performing the same role as you in other stores around the world so that you can learn from their experiences. And the way that you might do that is as follows. So get, you know, get quite specific with the help of the business in terms of how people's work is going to be different in this world because that will help more people understand where the benefit might be and therefore they'll adopt more readily. Leaders need to be active and involved in this. So it's no good leaders saying, yes, I agree that enterprise social networking is an awesome thing you should be doing and if you want to talk to me about it, just send me an email. That's, that's not good enough. Leaders have to be modeling the behaviors you want to see the rest of the organization do because that is one of the single biggest drivers of getting people to adopt. People naturally follow by example. It's a factor of the human condition. So you want to get your leaders modeling the behaviors you want to see. There is a huge benefit for leaders on being something, on something like this because they actually can understand exactly what people feel and think about the organization. One of the biggest challenges executives have is trying to understand whether people at the shop floor level understand the strategy and what it means for them. So it's a great opportunity for them to understand how the organization actually feels about what is going on. And helping them embrace that will allow them to then model that behavior to people, which will then create a virtuous cycle of people adopting. Solve a real business problem. 
actually, so actually help solve something that the business has a challenge with. Go and ask people what their challenges are and work out which ones might fit the type of communication that enterprise social networking allows you to do. Because if you're solving real things, you can prove real value, you can prove real return on investment, uh, and you're not just touting a new and exciting technology to people. You're actually helping people get work done. Use a compelling event for launch to bring the idea of this to people's minds. So we've seen our customers do everything from uh, you know, putting, uh, putting yams on desks to uh, doing big launch events inside their organization, to holding executive-style town halls, to giving people cupcakes. So we can do all sorts of things, but the purpose is to raise awareness that this is a legitimate channel for communicating on. So it's not to say this is an awesome thing and you should use it for everything. It's to say we, ha as an organization, have decided that this is something that is, it is okay to use. Never underestimate the number of people in your organization that might be, have a question in their mind as to whether they're allowed to use something or not. So a launch event can really help in legitimizing the platform to people. And one of the most compelling drivers of sustained success is the idea of just sharing where people have got value from it and sharing that with other people and saying, hey, they, they got, they, they, here's a great story of where people got use out of this. Could you do something similar? And put them all in a group and direct people to that so that when they join the network, they've got a place to go and get inspired from. And they can see these stories and say, oh, that's really interesting. How did you do that? And then people start to enable each other, and you get a really positive cycle of things going on. So we have a short video. Um, at Yammer, we work with consultants, uh, people that do a lot of the research, not just on Yammer, but on a number of social tools and collaboration aspects. And so this one is uh, covering email. Business Practices That Refuse to Die, number 44, Email Trees. Let's keep this simple. You need to make a decision, but need the input from four team members. So you draft an email and send it to the team. Person number one replies to all. So does person number two. But three and four only reply back to you. In addition, unbeknownst to you, person number four emails person number five who thinks they should have a say in the decision as well. Person number five replies to everyone. You gather all the feedback and send a synopsis back out to everyone. You also receive emails from persons number one and two asking why number five was included in on the discussion. You reply back to them that, although not ideal, it'll be okay. Person number five also forwarded the email to person number six, who at this time also replied to all, but didn't get the last email. So, to include her, you forward her the last email and CC everyone else just to let them know that person number six was in on the discussion now too. You now email everyone with a final decision and want their buy-in. Person number six asks for one small change. You agree, make the change, and email everyone again for an agreement. Everyone emails you that they agree. By the end of this madness, 61 emails have been sent to make one decision. That certainly is not collaboration at its finest. How can we avoid this in the future? Instead of sending an email, you ask your question in a collaborative environment. Everyone responds and reads each other's responses and suggests that person number five and six be invited, which you do. They too read the thread, add their two bits, and everyone is on the same page. You make the final decision, person number six adds a change, you revise, and everyone buys off. Done. Now think about how much time your team saved by using the collaborative space. Multiply that by the number of in-depth email conversations you have in a day, and you can see the savings. Plus, the conversation is in one place, you can easily find it again if you need to refer to it later, and it saved your team a ton of email frustration, which always makes your team happier. Now raise your hand if you think your team could have spent those hours doing something more valuable. Exactly. So, what are you going to do about it?
So that's one of many business practices that refuse to die. Email is a big one. Um, there's obviously uses for email. You know, we always say that. Um, but it's also finding all the other ways that you can make sure and get your work done and make sure you save, save time. So what you saw there wasn't actually Yammer. I'll take you now through that. Just a, just a question there. How many people have experienced that situation? <laughs> awesome. Right. So yeah. it's, it's a great... It's, it, it's not awesome. Um, <laughs> simple things like that are what will make the light bulb go off for a lot of people around what the sort of thing that enterprise social networking can do for them. Just really, just really, really simple things like instead of us having a meeting where we all sit around a table and tell each other what we've done that week, why don't we just start a conversation thread and say, what have you been up to this week? Can you reply? And then when you all sit in your meeting, you can actually talk about what you've learned from what everyone has provided an update for, rather than sitting and listening to everyone telling you what they've been up to. And therefore, you can spend less time in meetings and more time actually doing work. So it's, you know, these, there's some really, really simple things that you can point out to people is part of the magic of just... And it, all it is is that you're having an open conversation about things. So this is our demo network, but it's actually... It looks exactly the way that Yammer works, minus the branding on the top, of course. Um, but as you can see, uh, these are your groups here. So you can have your departments, projects that you're working on. Um, I can quickly switch from a group to another one. Um, where we start really is home. That's really where you get the pulse uh, of your organization is what you see here is top all and following. So I'm able to quickly gauge what are the top, the most popular conversations happening uh, in the organization at the moment, even though I haven't been mentioned in them, of course. Then you have all, just to get all the conversations that are going on, so it will show the most recent on the top. And then you have the one that I really like, which is following. That's following people, that's following content, uh, any conversations that I've cut up with that I want to be notified, um, and I'm able to quickly see there. And one of the first ones you see is my colleague, Pia. She's currently working at the Yammer booth, uh, shared a deck with me, and I shared the presentation with her, and it's just quickly able to do that. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's many other conversations on there. On the right-hand side, you can quickly see the recent activity that people have done. So that's not just conversations, but that's also people have shared files, opened different things, deleted. Um, you have suggested people. So if you're not following maybe some of the people working in your department or people that are doing very similar things, you're able to uh, see that suggested as well as groups. Um, and a lot of the trending files and the company resources are easily accessible on, on the right-hand side as well. Uh, and then one of the things that we, we also have is Office Web Apps, which is coming. You'll be able to quickly you know, open up a PowerPoint presentation and work within the network. So you see the same things that you would see in PowerPoint, but you're able to quickly ask other colleagues to contribute as well. And you can see the people that are currently editing that document also within Yammer. The other thing we have as well is uh, translation. So you can actually, for global companies, you can have this across your network, people speaking in different languages, and then you just have, you press translate, and it turns it to your default language on the network, which makes it really easy to collaborate people uh, with people from across, across the world. Um, and you can always go back and show the original text as well. So this, is, th this has actually had a huge impact on a lot of global organizations we work with. That Talk about machine translation aside. I'm sure, I'm sure we, can, we, can all, we can all talk about that. But the, 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 just the simple idea that you can actually understand what your colleagues on the other side of the world are, are talking about. We, we, have, we work with you know, global brewing companies, telcos, who say that this has is, this is allowed people who, for whom English is not their native language to really connect, feel connected with the rest of the organization and contribute to conversations. Um, it's 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 been actually been really amazing to see the impact that this has had. So anybody that works for an organisation that ha that deals with multiple languages, I'm sure you can recognise that this this solves a real challenge for people. And so, just uh, one of the last things I'll cover is, you know, this is the SharePoint integration that you see on Yammer. So you're able to have everything you, you would usually see on SharePoint, 
but then you're also able to embed that Yammer feed within SharePoint. And so it's very easy to have that conversation. Whether you decide to have it on Yammer or SharePoint doesn't really matter. You'll see both of the same things happening. So you'll have a marketing group on Yammer and marketing campaigns on SharePoint. Um, and you usually see your documents and everything that's going on. You reply in the same way that you would uh, reply on Yammer as well. And you're able to follow that conversation. So if you want to learn more about Yammer, we obviously have a Yammer booth for you to come over. I think I've seen some of you already as well. Make sure you check our, our blog. We have a lot of customer stories happening there. Um, you can sign up for certifications. We have several different levels of certifications. Um, we have a great site called success.yammer.com. And we have a lot of documentation that you can download from that site. Uh, I tell a lot of customers, you know, try not to recreate the wheel. Um, we've done everything from usage policies to the way that you communicate with users. We have a lot of the templates that you can repurpose for your own business. Um, and just log into yammer.com and see how many people are already from your business are already on there um, and get started. So just before, just before we go to questions, I just wanted to ask you, you guys a few questions. So firstly, was this session what you were expecting? Put your hands up if it was. Cool. OK. I'm expecting questions from people for whom the session was not what they were expecting. So we've allowed some time for this, just this eventuality. Um, how many of you feel like you understand a bit more about what enterprise social networking can do for organizations? How many of you feel like you would be in a position to add value to your line of business and are going to go and have a conversation with them? Cool. All right. So we've kind of half done our job then. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's good. Um, before we do all the, all the bits about feedback for the, for the session and things, does anybody have any questions based on what they've seen or things you thought we were going to cover but didn't? Uh, gentleman at the back there. So the question about having a conversation, whether you have it in SharePoint or Yammer, is for ex yeah. So when this is a, the Yammer app for SharePoint, um, you can integrate. The, the aspect of it is that once you integrate within that specific group from Yammer, you can integrate more of the network. So it's not just the people that are using SharePoint, but you can access people that might not access SharePoint and access only that Yammer group. So that's a good way to make sure that you're covering all your bases. You're covering the people that are already using SharePoint, but also people that are using Yammer. Um, and that integrates. So you can see all the conversation. You can see all the documents, the same things you would see once you do that full integration. And the, um, the guidance, so the guidance we would give around conversations and where they where they would live is that if you're going to make if you're going to make an investment and a bet in social then do that with do that with yammer lead with yammer because that's where the you know that's where a lot of the uh, the development around social will be focused it's the thing that is moving most quickly in terms of iteration and if for whatever reason you can't go into the cloud then use 2013's social capabilities to to do that and the roadmap around, around Yammer is that we're looking then to fold that more cleanly into the SharePoint experience over time. But we find that Yammer will drive greater engagement around, what, around the types of things that we've been talking about. So the guidance would be you know, pick one place to, for people to have the, the conversation and the, and, the, and the connections between individuals. And you should lead as, that, as Yammer as that thing, because that's, that's where you want the social graph to live. Gentlemen there. Okay, so 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 the question was around what are the plans for integration of functionality, SharePoint and Yammer, what's the, what's the future around that? So we've already done some, uh, some, some initial things around that. So, so the initial focus has been around 
things like allowing you to replace your your news feed within uh, you know within SharePoint Online with with the Yammer news feed. Uh, we're looking over time to come up with with more in-depth in integrations. So the the next thing up will be the, the SharePoint app within. Uh, or the Yammer app within, within SharePoint. And then longer term, we're looking at more connected experiences and how to build those things out. So we showed, for example, the kind of the, the Office, Office uh, 365 document integration, expect more things of that ilk over time. Actually, and our CTO, uh, uh, CTO co-founder says this a lot, Yammer itself doesn't know what enterprise social network is gonna look like in, in 18 months time. Yammer's development methodology is very much one where we we recognize that half of the bets that we make around what people are going to want to use social for are going to be wrong, and we don't know which half they are. So what we do is we iterate very rapidly, we test things, and we only deploy things that have test successfully tested to drive engagement effectively. So what you, what you trade off in predictability, you gain in engagement of end users. And so what we're asking is for people to buy into that methodology and that approach, which is driven very much from how consumer Web, web organizations work. There's a lot of A-B testing, a lot of, a lot of identifying what drives engagement of people. And you know, go with us on that journey, because it's one where you know, we can't tell you what this space will look like in 18 months' time, but we know we're going to be there or thereabouts, because we've, we have confidence in the method that we're applying. Any other questions? So the question was around speed of adoption and uh, whether people are going to, uh, people will readily ask questions but not necessarily hang about to answer them. And how do you deal with the culture around that? Is that right? So a couple of things there. Um, as Miguel said, you've got to get this to a point where it is not something people see as an additional thing to check. They see it as a way of getting some of their work done. And then the benefit around the, of being able to then see what other people are asking and answer that comes as a result of people being on there doing their work anyway. Um, so that's how you get it done in the long term. In the short term, what you find is that there is a, in every organization, there is a relatively small proportion of people who will naturally think in this way and gravitate towards the network. And they will be the people that start it off. So you need to get to the minds of those people that says, look, if you, you, know, if you think in this way, here's a place for you to be and, and work out. And they will be the people that start the growth of that community because they'll start off by answering other people's questions. Then they'll get bored of that. And what they'll do instead is they'll phone up a friend and say, you've got the best answer to this question. Come onto the network. And that's the point that I was talking about earlier on about virality is that you because it allows you to just invite other people in when they would be useful, that's how it actually, that's how it grows in practice. Somebody says, you should come on because there's some things that are interesting to you on here. And then they come in and they, ha and they, they participate. And then the trick is to say, is to take those odd one, two, three interactions and have a conversation with those people and say, you do realize that if you th think about working differently, this can help you on a much larger scale. And this, here's how, here's how you could use it as a store manager, as somebody that works in a contact center, as somebody that leads research and development. Does that, does that help? And the other thing on to, with that as well is that when we first start working with you, um, the important thing is to get the community managers together. So Mike mentioned some of this is getting people that are already comfortable using the tool. So 
one of the big jobs for community managers is to make sure that when people do go on there and ask questions, they are the connectors. So even though not everyone might be on there at the same time or might not be there to answer the question, is they either answer the question if they can or they bring in the right people to do it. So you need that small core group of people that are going to be there initially to make sure that you know, they capture every, all the conversations that are, that are going on and they make sure to bring other people that might, not, you know, that might be a bit more timid in using the tool. So that is another important aspect that we help you with as well. Any other questions? No? OK. Um, feel, free to, uh, feel free to tap us up at the, at the DJ booth um, after, the, after the session. Yeah. Um, there are some, some great resources for you to take a look at. Um, we can, we'll tweet out some links to these as well after the, after the event and tag it with the, the TechEd tag for you to take a look at. Um, take a look at the customer success stories. So the, these, these stories of people that are talking about how this sort of thing has changed the way they work is a great source of inspiration, um, a great opportunity to, um, to understand where this, where this really has impact in organizations. So these are some of the sessions that you've already seen and the hands-on labs, some of the stuff that we recommend for you to do as well, um, alongside the stuff that we've talked about today. And uh, come and see us at the booth. We are, yeah. we are in, the, um, in the Tech Expo. We're under the socialized banner. Um, come and see us uh, with the guys wearing blue shirts. That should easily distinguish us from everyone else. Um, so uh, come, and, come and chat, ask us some questions. Uh, once you've had a chance to have a think about it, we're here all week. materials I'm sure you know about. Um, and scan. if you'd like to evaluate this session, please scan this ridiculously large QR code. Um, and uh, and please, please rate us. Tell, us. tell us where we've done well. Tell us where we've not done well. Um, we, do these things, we do these things a lot um, and really appreciate the feedback. So please take the time to, uh, please take the time to rate us. Um, I hope this was a useful session for you all. I hope you enjoy lunch and the rest of TechEd. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you.